Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today's program will be, uh, I'm honored, first of all, I'm honored to have uh, Dr. Van Norda accepted our invitation to come and talk about uh, the one of the nature's masterpieces uh, to me, uh, rainbows, which is a uh, beautiful phenomenon in, in nature. And um, the Dr. Van Nuda is the retired professor of physics from Fresno State. And he has, although he has moved out of the area, but he's still uh, very giving to the community, to the community that he used to work and live for some time. And I appreciate that. And um, uh, I'm gonna let you guys know that uh, this uh, program will be recorded and you can hold your um, questions after the discussion, after the lecture of uh, Dr. Nurda and uh, then you can uh, type in your, uh, or in, put it in the chat, your questions and any comments that you might have. And we will take it from there. And uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Hans van Norda to take it over from now. Welcome. Thank you, Nina. Um, I assume there is a chat function, is that, or how do people answer questions? Uh, people can put their uh, questions in the chat box and you read it uh, or I can read it and answer it. And you can answer, answer yeah, so, your lecture though. Oh, okay. Um, as I, I thought, if something is confusing, then maybe I should pause for just a second and let people ask a few questions and then continue. Is that possible or is that not? Of course, of course. Okay, all righty. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I liked uh, Nina's introduction, Nina abdul on introduction, because uh, the rainbow is really uh, quite spectacular and has actually been very important to science. And so uh, what I would like to do is uh, share my screen now and uh, talk a little bit about the rainbow. I uh, thank you all for coming. Okay. So um, let me share uh, some slides with you. Okay. So uh, there is a book on the history of the rainbow that was written in the 1950s or 1960s. Uh, and the title of the book was The Rainbow from Myth to Mathematics. And I changed the mathematics to quantum mechanics uh, because basically that mathematics turns out to be quantum mechanics. And uh, so, uh, humans, since our existence, uh, we have had questions about the rainbow. And these questions have advanced knowledge of optics throughout the ages. And some of the questions that people have asked are, one, uh, why is there an arc? Okay? Why is it an arc? Another question that people have asked is, uh, why is it located in this point in the sky? For example, why is it not down here or up there? Why is it the arc here? Okay. Another question that people have asked is why is it colored? Okay. If it wasn't colored, uh, then it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. Okay. And then another question is what causes supernumerary bows? Okay. Now, I uh, you may not have heard of supernumerary bows before. I will show you an example in just a second. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, discuss 
the parts of a rainbow. So when we see a rainbow, we always see the primary bow. So this is the primary bow. Okay? And the primary bow has its colors. This is a piece blown up of this rainbow down here. Okay. And red is always on top and violet's on the bottom. Uh, and uh, then another part of the rainbow is um, uh, the secondary bow. And it also has colors, but the colors are reversed. Red is on the bottom, violet's on the top. And the way I like to remember this it, um, is this way, infrared. So the red is between the two bows. And ultraviolet, the, uh, light, the violet is on the edges of the rainbow. Now, if you look carefully, uh, you also notice that there's a dark band between the two rainbows, between the secondary bow and the primary bow. Obviously, also, uh, the secondary bow is dimmer uh, than the primary bow. And uh, sometimes the secondary bow is not visible. Uh, I've noticed that when I look at rainbows, I, if I look very carefully, I usually can find a trace of it. Okay. Uh, then I mentioned uh, the supernuminary bows. This picture doesn't show this too well yet. Okay. Um, if you blow up this region here, which has been done here, you have the primary bow with red on top and violet on the bottom. Okay. And then the colors repeat, blue and violet. That's a supernuminary bow. Now I admit that this is not, this uh, su demonstration of a supernuminary bow is not very impressive. So I have the next slide. Uh, this is a supernuminary rainbows over New Jersey. Uh, this was during a hurricane. It's taken during a hurricane or the tail end of a hurricane. The hurricane may have become a, a big rainstorm. And uh, in this uh, rain, there's a primary bow that you see here, okay? Red on top, uh, blue on the bottom. And then you see all these other bows here. And there's quite a few of them. And those are supernuminary bows. And these bows uh, aren't always visible. In this case, they're visible because the drop size is the same. What do I mean by that? Well, there's rain falling. And in this uh, case, the raindrops are all about the same size. And when they're all about the same size, then you can see supernuminary bows. In many rain, uh, rainstorms, when you see a rainbow, uh, there are drops of varying sizes and then you can't see the supernuminary bow so much. So uh, to answer some of these questions, the first thing people turn to are uh, the laws of light rays. Uh, officially, this subject is called geometrical optics. Now, what the idea of light rays is the following. Uh, suppose you have a flashlight indicated here, okay? And we know that light comes out of the flashlight. And so to uh, demonstrate that light comes out of flashlight, we draw these lines. And these are essentially fictitious. We call them light rays. And how, how many do we draw? Well, as many as we need or as few as we need. And the, the laws of light rays, there's essentially two, or the laws of geometrical optics, there's essentially two laws. One is the law of reflection, okay? Suppose that light is coming from air and heads to water. Some of that light will be reflected off the surface. 
And so we have a light coming in represented by a ray and the reflected light coming out. And the law of reflection says that the angle in is equal to angle out. And this law was known to the ancients. Okay, so that's the law of reflection, okay? And Aristotle thought that the rainbow was due, uh, due a special law of reflection. It turns out that the, uh, the rainbow um, is formed not just by reflection. It's also formed by refraction, okay? This is the bending of light at a surface. For example, suppose again, we have light uh, that's coming from air and going to water. The light will hit the surface and then it will bend. So if the light comes in at an angle to, the, to this dashed line, uh, then the light will bend, meaning that the light's not gonna go straight, it's going to go at a different path. This is a transmitted light, okay? Now, uh, the exact law was first discovered by Ibn Sal in uh, 984 in Baghdad. And uh, the Europeans didn't know about this law until about 600 years later, okay? So the exact, they didn't know the exact law, okay? So, uh, with these laws, we can explain uh, quite a bit about the rainbow, okay? Uh, now, in 1300, okay, using these two laws, okay, uh, people developed some understanding of the rainbow. Uh, first, there was the Islamic scholar Al-Farisi, okay? I believe he was in Damascus, okay? And then there was also Theodoric of Freiburg. Um, that's in Germany, okay, in Europe. At this time, uh, much of the knowledge of the Europeans actually came uh, from the Islamic scholars, okay? It traveled uh, through Spain. Okay? So um, Al-Farisi um, did experiments with flasks and sent light through a flask. So here's a, a drawing, okay, um, of a water droplet. So imagine that you have a water droplet, a round water droplet, and you slice it in half, okay? And this uh, round circle represents that slice. Now this diagram, if you first look at it, it looks kind of complicated. So what I did was drew only the dashed lines, okay? And these are the rays for the primary bow. So what happens is that uh, Al-Farisi uh, said that the light is coming from here, okay? And he indicates light, just like from the flashlight. Uh, these rays are coming away from this source of light, okay? And then they bend here at, the water surface, then they go through the water, they reflect, okay, and then they bend again as they go back into air. Now he also shows that light keeps going, okay? That's true, but that, that um, when we're looking at the rainbow, our eye is over here, okay? And so we see the light coming over here. So there's one reflection uh, due there's one reflection for the pri primary bow. And then the solid rays or lines re represent rays from uh, the, for the, that produce the secondary bow. Now, if you notice here, he drew all the rays uh, go, going to the top of the drop. Down here, he draws all the rays going to the bottom of the drop. And the difference between the primary bow and the secondary bow is that in the secondary bow, there's two reflections. So the light goes, bends here, goes here, reflects, uh, goes over there, reflects, 
and then uh, it comes down out towards the observer. Okay, so this is an understanding. Theodore Rick of Freiburg also had a, some diagram which was somewhat similar to this. The two uh, scholars didn't know each other. Uh, for Alfarisi's diagram, in my opinion, is much better. Okay, um, so uh, then we get to Descartes. Now, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Are there any questions at this point? I don't see any questions. Okay, so then I will continue to share. Yeah. And continue talking. Is that good? Yep, sure. Okay. So let me close this. Okay. So, um, Then we have Descartes' explanation of the rainbow. Um, I think Descartes is uh, very famous for saying, I think, therefore I am, okay? Um, he also, one of the things that he thought about was the rainbow, okay? So by this time, uh, the Europeans um, understood both the law of reflection and the law of refraction, okay? And, uh, or the bending of light. So what uh, Descartes did is he made a very accurate drawing. And so first he drew what I call the inner rays. I'll explain in a moment why I'm calling these inner rays. So uh, this diagram is slightly different in that uh, Descartes is assuming that the light from this incoming sunlight is parallel, okay? And that's an approximation, but that's a, a fairly good approximation, okay? So just like in uh, Farisi's diagram, uh, the light bends over here, it reflects over here, okay? And then it goes out the drop and back into the air, okay? Uh, then uh, the, the cart, uh, drew what I call the outer rays, okay? These are these green rays, okay? And they're also parallel, okay? And so here is, uh, it indicates as refraction, bending of light, okay, reflection, okay? Now, what you notice about what I'm calling these outer rays, this is not a general terminology, is that they bend further in. Okay, so take a look at this black ray here. See, it goes over here. These rays are not, don't go out as far over into this direction, okay? And it turns out uh, that there's one ray called the ray of minimum deviation. So why is it called the ray of minimum deviation? Well, the light, everything is coming in parallel. So the light was going in the direction of this line, okay, horizontally. And then after it emerged from the drop, okay, uh, it turned this angle of 138 degrees, okay? And then you get the ray of minimum deviation. And so what happens is uh, all uh, rays, turn more. For example, this ray here goes like this, okay, and then does not quite a 180, but close to a 180 and goes back. The ray of minimum deviation doesn't do a 180, it does a 138, so to speak, okay? And so, um, <clears throat> when I've, only shown a few rays here, but Descartes drew lots and lots of rays. And what he found out was that most of the rays end up right around the ray of minimum deviation. So there are many more rays at the rainbow angle of 138. And so by doing this drawing, he showed that uh, the 
rainbow appears at the ray of minimum deviation. So this is where the rainbow appears, right here. Not here, okay? Not over here, but right here. Okay, now we want to address the question, uh, why is the uh, rainbow colored? And Newton in 1704, okay, at least that's when he published the book okay, that describes the crucial optics experiment of his. What he did was uh, he took white light and sent it through a prism. Now, the way they did these experiments in those days is they didn't have artificial lights. So basically they would, uh, would work in a dark room and then somewhere high in the wall or something, they would make a tiny hole and then the sunlight would come in a tiny hole. Then the sunlight would hit a prism, okay? And the hole that uh, Newton made in the wall was exactly round. So the beam of white light was round. And then when it went through the prism, uh, the beam became an oval like this, a colored oval, okay? Red, and blue, yellow, and so forth, green, okay? And one of the questions that Newton asked himself is, um, is this color, and by this time, I guess it was known that there were these colors, okay? Is the color because of the prism? Is that a property of this prism, this piece of glass? Or is it a property of the light that's coming in? So what he decided to do was send the light through another prism. However, he only let red light go through the second prism. And so he sent red light through the second prism and out came red light only, and the beam became round again. And he, he carefully thought about this experiment and uh, carefully analyzed it, and he came to some conclusions. The first was, that color is a property of light, okay? And so it's not a property of the prism, color is a property of light. So each color is a different kind of light. And uh, his analysis, uh, because he sent it, the red light only through this prism, his analysis allowed him to conclude, okay? That's only a property of light. Another conclusion you get from doing this experiment, you, uh, since the round beam became an oval, okay, different colors of light bend or refract different amounts through a prism. So they bend, blue, bend, blue is down here and it bends more, and red bound, uh, is up here and it bends less, okay? And so uh, this crucial experiment uh, explained why a rainbow is colored, because different colors of light then refract different amounts. So what does a ray theory of light say okay, about the rainbow? First, as we uh, said previously, the secondary bow is due to an extra reflection. It has two reflections. The primary has one reflection. In these drawings here, uh, these lines represent the ray of minimum deviation. And this is where most of the rays are, okay? So sunlight comes in, or the sec uh, it comes in, it bends at Coming into the water drop, it reflects, it reflects, then going out of the water drop and it heads to the eye of the observer. For the primary, the sunlight comes in the, the bottom, the top, 
Okay, here you see the light comes in the bottom. Here the light comes in the top. Okay, it reflects once and then goes to the observer. Now, uh, what happens is that each raindrop sends one color to the observer. So the drops up here are only sending red light to the observer. The ge geometry is such that this angle between the sunlight and the light going to the observer is always 42 degrees. Where did I get the 42 from? Well, it's 180 minus 138. Okay. And I said, that different colors bend different amounts. So it's not exactly 42, but for each color, the angle is the same, okay? And for all the colors, roughly average, the angle is 42 degrees. So it's this geometry uh, that governs uh, the rainbow, okay? And that a lot, if you have a drop down here, okay, then only it can only send blue light to this observer. And um, this, dro this drop here uh, represents a drop at the bottom of the secondary bulb. Okay. And that only sends in red light. Okay. And so the rainbow is actually formed by many, many drops of water in the sky. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Is the size of the raindrops mm, the same in, in this uh, graphic? I mean, they are the same sizes so that it, only the location of the raindrop through uh, makes the different colors. So, so um, I'm going to say something and then I want you to ask me further if it's not clear. So if this, uh, sorry, uh, let me back up. Uh, this uh, picture here is a picture of an actual rainbow. And I think in this rainbow, I don't know exactly, but I think in this rainbow, uh, the water drops were not all of the same size. Why? Uh, because I don't see any supernuminary bows, or it's very hard to see them. So now, um, I, what, could you ask your question again? Actually, I realized that uh, you're right. They're, they're not the same. If they were the same, then it would be supernumerary uh, bows. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, now you're, um, I may not have answered your question completely because uh, this, ge this, geometry that I, this geometry that I described here is true for various drops if they're round. Now, and so even if this, if here obviously I exaggerated this and this is a very big drop, but for a very big drop, it's the geometry is the same as for a very small drop, okay? Uh, there are differences between big drops and small drops, but not in this angle here. Now, the other thing is uh, when the, in actuality, if you have a big drop, it won't be round. It'll be kind of squashed. And Probably that's not too surprising that when a uh, drop is uh, falling through the sky and if it's too big, it's not going to be quite round. And so this is a first approximation, you could say, to explaining the rainbow. Even so, uh, assuming that the uh, drops are round is not bad, especially when the drops get smaller. I don't know, I talked more than your question. I don't, 
know if I've answered everything. Yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> so the uh, next question we want to ask is why is a rainbow arced? Okay. And as we were talking, the ang angle between sunlight and light into the eye is always 42 degrees. They no matter the orientation of the slice producing the light sent into the eye. So over here, we have a vertical slice, okay? And so the geometry, if it's a vertical slice, then it sends light in this way. Whereas over here, we have an angled slice, okay? And so then a different, the light is going essentially through a different slice of the drop and it heads over here. And so over here, say where uh, the, if there's a drop here, essentially the slice is now horizontal. And so this, there's the same geometry, but the, uh, the geometry which was vertical over here is now horizontal over here. And so red light gets sent over to the observer. So uh, that is my explanation of why the rainbow is arced, okay? The geometry is 42 degrees also explains because this is the incoming sunlight, okay? And this is the light going to the observer also explains why the rainbow is seen here and not here. Drops that are down here, they don't send light to the observer because the, uh, the, the angle is always around 42 degrees and the light coming here will be sent down below the observer. Uh, if you think about it a little bit, uh, then you realize that each observer sees a different rainbow because their positions are different. Like if, if we all went out as a group to look at rainbows, we can't all stand in exactly the same spot. And so when we're standing at different spots, then different drops are uh, sending light our way. Or, and so we each see a slightly different rainbow. So I feel that uh, I've uh, tried to explain the first three questions. Why is the rainbow arced? Why does it appear in the sky where it does? And why is it colored? I have talked not at all about the supernumeraries, okay? And so what about the supernumeraries? Remember, this was, in this picture, this was a primary bow, okay? And these are the super. Uh, let me go back. Uh, these are the supernumerary bows. Okay. So um, the supernumerary bows. Uh, to understand them is much more complicated. So complicated that if you were to go to to a university to study physics. Uh, in your undergraduate years, you would, they would never explain it to you. Now, around 1700, uh, there were two, at least two theories of light, two famous ones, okay? There was Isaac Newton. Newton said light consists of particles. A contemporary of Isaac Newton was Christian Huygens. And he said light consists of waves and the waves add. So uh, this is one of his drawings. And uh, he thinks of this candle flame as having as a multiple sources of light. So for example, the point A is a source of light, the point B is a source of light, and point C is a source of light. And this source of light a uh, produces a little wavelet. So this is A's wavelet. 
Okay. And uh, point C, for example, uh, produces this wavelet. And according to Huygens, okay, uh, these wavelets add. Okay. And so eventually you get kind of a smooth wave, and you can think of these lines as crests of waves, and in between there's a trough. I'm going to talk more about waves in a second. Okay. And so according to Huygens, the light just adds and then you get a smooth wave. And if your eye is over here, for example, then uh, that's how the light comes to you. Now for a century, Newton's idea prevailed. And nobody, well, it's not true nobody, very few people thought about the wave theory of light. One uh, person that did think of the wave theory of light is the famous mathematician Euler. But anyway, for most of that century, Newton's idea prevailed. And since um, Descartes and uh, Newton and so forth, and uh, Al-Farisi had explained essentially everything about the primary bow and the secondary bow, uh, what was left to explain were the supernary, supernumerary bows. And so more and more people started asking questions about the supernumerary bows, okay? And Thomas Young, okay, um, asked questions. Now, uh, he asked what causes the supernumerary bows? Now he noted, so he noticed, that the outer and the inner rays form complementary pairs because if you look at the, this is a complementary pair here and here. Why? Because when the light goes out of the raindrop, it's parallel. And uh, so you can pair up many of the outer rays with many of the inner rays and get parallel rays, okay? It, now, what's the significance of the rays being parallel? It means they go to the same place. So if there's observers down here, okay, and the observer is quite far away from this drop, then both of these rays or both these sorts of light will end up in the observer's eye. So, um, Young uh, wondered about these two rays. He thought that maybe these two uh, rays of low light don't always add. And Young revives the wave theory and asks, can light waves interfere? Okay, so here we have two complementary rays close to the ray of minimum deviation, okay? The outer ray and the inner ray, okay? And what is the idea of interference for light from two sources heading to the eye? I'm gonna show you two extremes. The first extreme we call total constructive. So somewhere down here or over here is our eye, okay? And imagine, that light is coming from the outer ray, okay? And the light from the outer ray is like a water wave. And so there's a crest and a trough, a crest and a trough. And so these are entering our eyes. At one moment, the crest is entering an eye, another moment, the trough is entering our eye and so forth, okay? And then there's also the inner ray or the, and the light from it, okay? And uh, when it comes into our eye, it's also it could be a crest, a trough, a crest, and a trough. Well, now if you add these crests on top of a crest, then you get a bigger crest. This is what happens with water waves. Okay. If you add a trough on top of a trough, you get a deeper trough. Okay. And so the idea for light is that you get a bigger wave, so you get bright light where there's constructive interference. 
because the waves add. The other extreme is total destructive interference. Now what happens is that you have a trough on top of a crest. So here, here's a trough, okay, from light from the outer part of the drop. And here's a crest from light from the inner part of the drop, okay? And when you add a trough to a crest, you don't get anything, you get zero. And so you, no light is seen. That was this idea. Now, uh, this is a little bit hard to do with the rainbow. So Young thought of an experiment. And this experiment is quite famous in physics. It's called Young's double slit experiment. And this experiment was at least partially motivated uh, by these supernumerary bows. And nowadays, uh, we have lasers, okay? But in Young's day, there were no lasers. Lasers are coherent sources of light. Now, what does that mean? Um, that means that all the light is of the same color, okay? Um, and in order to see some of this, you need to have coherent light. So the first thing that Young did was he created a plate with a single slit in it. All he really had at his disposal was white light, okay? And the difference between crests you can see here is different. And the light is all also going at different angles. So th that's why we say it's incoherent light, okay? But by putting this slit here, uh, Young can make the light coherent. Now, the, uh, here you see that the distance between crests is still larger than the difference between crests here, okay? Uh, the difference between crests is known as the wavelength, okay? And so, uh, another way of saying it is that we have light of different colors traveling through here. But you see that this light is still more, co more coherent, why? Because whenever there's a crest at this top hole, so this is the double slit, this is a plate with two slits in it. Whenever there's a crest at the top hole, there's a crest at the bottom hole. And so as a consequence, uh, there's some coherence there, okay? And then when the light goes through those slits, okay, you get these wavelets, this from the top, okay? and this from the bottom, okay? And they can interfere because here you have a crest on top of a crest, okay? Here you have a crest on top of a crest. And you get constructive interference, okay? And then at this point, for example, you have a crest, okay? And no, so this is a crest, but this is halfway between troughs. So uh, this is a crest on top of a trough. So that's destructive interference and there is no light. That's the explanation. What happens when you do the experiment? You see this kind of pattern, okay? This is a schematic, okay? You see, Constructive interference. This black region is destructive interference. There's no light here, okay? Uh, here, there's a lot of light, okay? That's constructive. Then this little narrow band here is destructive. Now, if you do a lot of mathematics, okay, then you can actually find the intensity pattern, okay? And you find that the light is brightest over here, okay? And there's no light here. That's what this intensity pattern says. This is the intensity as a function of position. So uh, Young did this double slit experiment and he saw this pattern. And this pattern uh, looks sort of like the pattern from supernumerary bows. And indeed, uh, that's what happens. 
Now, what we this has been known for a long time. But, uh, in in my lab, we repeated this experiment. So what we did was had a stream of water indicated by this blue circle. Okay, it, uh, we're looking down at the top. The water is dropping into the page, so to speak. Okay, now we've shown a laser at the drop of water, and then we place a screen there, and uh, we noted where the light landed. Okay, and this is the result of this experiment. And so what we see here uh, is this is the primary bow. And actually here you can see some supernuminaries. This is the secondary bow. This is the dark region. We also call this the forbidden region. But basically there's no light appears here. And what you see is that this pattern is very much like the double slit pattern. Okay, you have constructive interference, destructive interference, these peaks. And so what happens is that this peak is, causes the primary bow. And the, all these other peaks cross, cause the supernuminary bows. It's very, very hard to see these bows above the secondary bow. But if you shine a laser at it, you do see the same pattern on the screen. So this was uh, data from uh, Jamie Vargas. He's now uh, the physics teacher at Edison High. It's based on the data from, from Jamie Vargas. Okay. So the mathematics to apply Young's idea is complicated. Okay. It took another 90 years after the theoretical development of electricity and magnetism to come up with a complete theory. Uh, a Danish man named Lorentz in 19, 1890 came up with it. Now it's often known as the Mu theory. And it's now actually part of quantum mechanics where there is light on the screen Particles of light called photons, that's what we call them, have landed. And the theory predicts the probability of a photon arriving on the screen. So I showed you this double, shit, double slit intensity pattern. We now interpret this as a probability pattern. So what we're saying is that at this peak, that it's highly probable to find a photon landing. And over here, where it's zero, the probability is zero of a photon landing. Now, people have done these experiments, probably in the last 50 years or so, uh, where they take very dim light, okay? And then they look on the screen, and these little dots are photons, okay? And this is a schematic. I'm, in a second, I'm going to show you an actual picture, okay? And so the idea is that in dim light, you will see some photons, particles of light landing on the screen. They light it up at certain places. Then if you wait longer, you get more dots, okay, more photons. You wait longer, then okay, all of a sudden you start and see sort of this pattern of lines, okay? You wait longer and the patterns of lines uh, becomes more pronounced, it's starting to look like this double slit pattern. And if you wait a long time, okay, uh, then you get this pattern. This pattern, normally when you sh shine a laser at a double slit, you see this because you're sending litter quadrillions of photons. In, the, in these experiments here, excuse me, uh, they're just sending a few photons at a time. And so I'll end here with, this is a picture, okay? Um, an actual pictures from an actual experiment, okay? Uh, so here, this is the first slide and you hardly see anything, okay? You wait longer and then you see some photons coming. You wait longer and see some photons coming and you see the double slit pattern. And so uh, what I, 
uh, I'm saying is that uh, in the rainbow, uh, you are seeing this interference, and this interference is a feature of quantum mechanics. So that's the end of my talk. Okay, and I went over a little, I think, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Nina, do you have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking and I realized that I was muted. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. Oh, yes. there is a question. Somebody, okay. Oh, okay. Is there a way we can have a copy of the PowerPoint? Actually, I was explaining that this uh, talk has been recorded and Dr. Hans has agreed for us, for the library to post it and streaming on the YouTube, uh, library YouTube channel. So be patient with us within a couple of days, we will post it on YouTube, library YouTube channel. One more question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, thank you for listening. It was a pleasure for me uh, to uh, talk to you. I don't, I don't see any other questions. And I appreciate your time, Hans, and... Uh, Oh, and I'm very um, grateful that you agreed for us to uh, stream this on the YouTube for our community. For, I mean, this is an um, excellent opportunity to learn in details from a master, <laughs> from a professor of physics. So I appreciate that. I learned a lot. But I, I admit, I have to go back to the tape and uh, watch it again. Thank you for participation and thank you for being here and hope to see you in future programs with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>